The period doubling that we saw in the logistic map is really the key to understanding how chaos develops in 1D. There are some fascinating patterns here. Recall the period doubling cascade that we saw in the logistic map, and let's consider other one-parameter families of one-dimensional maps which evolve from having simple dynamics to chaotic dynamics. So among the examples that we might look at are, of course, the logistic map, where now I'm going to use mu for my parameter. So mu times x times 1 minus x. Or I could use mu times sine of x. It looks kind of similar, but of course it's a very different function. It's a very different mapping. It's going to have different dynamics. Or I could take a different form of a quadratic, let's say mu minus x squared. Just use mu to rigidly translate that up and down. These are all examples of what we might call unimodal functions. Within the domain of interest, they just have a single, simple maximum. Now, what do we observe with these unimodal functions as we increase the values of mu. Well, let's take a look. We've seen the logistic equation, where as we get to a certain critical parameter, boom, we get a period doubling. And then if we very slowly increase that, we get another period doubling. And then another period doubling, and we get that cascading phenomenon that limits to a chaotic dynamical system. Now, what happens if instead of logistic, we switch to a sine model, mu times sine of x. As we increase mu, we see something very similar happening. That stable equilibrium hits a period doubling bifurcation. We get a periodic orbit of period two. There's another period doubling bifurcation, and another, and another, and it again accumulates. Does this happen in our third model, where we take mu minus x squared? Yes, it definitely does happen. That same sequence of period doubling bifurcations accumulating onto a limit. What do we observe in these different examples? And not just these three, but in others as well. There are some fascinating patterns to be seen as these period doublings accumulate onto this limit this critical parameter. If we denote by mu sub n the parameter value of the nth period doubling, then these are going to limit onto some critical parameter value mu sub infinity. Now for different one-dimensional maps, these values are going to be all over the place. They're going to be different. There's nothing special about the actual parameter values themselves. What is special is their asymptotics. How they limit. In the 1970s, physicists in groups working independently noticed that it seems like the rate of convergence is universal. What this means in particular is that if you take a limit as n goes to infinity of the differences between the period doubling parameter values, so for example, mu n minus 1 minus mu n minus 2, and then divide that by mu n minus mu n minus 1. You look at the ratios of the differences between subsequent period doublings, then this limit exists, at least it seems to, and it seems to be the number 4.669201609103 dot 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 dot. This number, which I would call lambda, is really telling you about the rate of accumulation of the period doublings. So to reformulate this, if I look at mu sub n minus mu infinity, that is how far are you away from that limiting value, then that grows like some constant times lambda to the minus n. So the asymptotics are all controlled by this lambda. Now, this doesn't matter whether you're looking at the logistic map or the sign or the anything, any one-dimensional map with just a single simple maximum, this unimodal condition that is converging to chaos expresses this universal behavior. And this universality caused a great deal of excitement. 
This number, 4.669201609103, is the number of chaos. It's the new pi. It's the new e. It's the new fundamental constant of the universe, leading to a new branch of science, the science of chaos. It's a little hard to express how frothy things were back then. People were so excited. Now, this is pretty cool, not gonna lie, but let's think with a little bit of perspective and hindsight. What is this number lambda? Why do I call it lambda? The physicists did not call it lambda. They gave it a different symbol. Hmm. Well, after a great deal of effort in the 1980s, Several mathematicians, most notably Lubitsch, McMullen, Sullivan, they proved some really key and difficult theorems about this lambda. And the idea is this. This is really bonus material. Let this one go if it doesn't make a lot of sense. But here's a hint as to some of the deeper mathematics behind this. Consider the space of all discrete time dynamical systems on an interval. There's some additional details here. I want this unimodality. I want some other things. Smoothness, don't worry about it so much. But this is not a single dynamical system we're looking at. We're looking at the space of all dynamical systems. And what this lambda really is, is the dominant eigenvalue of a certain operator on that space, something called a renormalization operator. This magical constant of the universe is, is really just an eigenvalue. And the cool thing is that some of the things that you have learned about dominant eigenvalues along the way wind up showing up in these very, very deep mathematical results that explain otherwise mysterious phenomena. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that eigenvalues are everywhere and are everywhere the key to understanding dynamical systems.